Every point of our space can be described with three coordinates, so we call our space three-dimensional. But what if there were an extra dimension, an extra axis that points into a new direction that doesn't exist in our world? There would be a huge variety of new shapes, but there is a problem. We can't see those four-dimensional shapes with our three-dimensional eyes. Hopefully, there are some tricks we can do to visualize those objects. The first way to visualize a four-dimensional shape is projection. For example, if we project the points and the edges of a four-dimensional hypercube, it would look like this. You can see that there is a cube inside a bigger cube. Let's see how it rotates. Notice how it doesn't look like rotation in the traditional sense. This rotation is hard to comprehend, because it is a four-dimensional cube projected onto a three-dimensional space, which is projected onto a two-dimensional screen. And while our eyes are three-dimensional, our retina is just two-dimensional, so we can see only two-dimensional images, and light and depth supply the third dimension. Take this 3D cube, for example. It looks like there is a square inside a bigger square. But because we have some intuition about 3D objects, we can see a whole 3D cube in this 2D picture. And we can also understand that this smaller square is just a further side of the cube. The same logic also applies to a tesseract, a four-dimensional hypercube. This smaller cube is just a further side of the tesseract. So, it becomes larger and smaller when the hypercube rotates. But it's hard to show other shapes like spheres, cylinders or tori with this method. So, in this video I want to focus on the second way of visualizing four-dimensional objects. Specifically breaking those four-dimensional objects into three-dimensional slices. First, let's look at an analogy one dimension lower. We can take a 3D solid torus and look at its slices in 2D. It's like MRI scan of a torus or a donut. We can also do the same thing with four-dimensional shapes. Let's see what happens if a tesseract passes through our three-dimensional space. We would see a cube that suddenly appears out of nowhere and then it suddenly disappears. But if the tesseract was rotated, it would look like this. A tetrahedron appears, then some of its faces turn into hexagons, then they turn into pentagons, and lastly the whole shape shrinks and disappears. We can compare it to a three-dimensional cube passing through a two-dimensional plane. Here we would see a square appearing and disappearing on the plane. And if the cube is rotated, we would see a triangle that appears, turns into a pentagon, a hexagon, a pentagon again and a triangle, before finally disappearing. Let's now look at a four-dimensional ball. When it passes through our space, it looks like a sphere that gradually grows and then gradually shrinks. Similarly, when a 3D ball passes through a 2D plane, it looks like a circle that gradually grows and then gradually shrinks. Now I want to show you one of my favorite shapes, a 3D solid torus. Let's look at its 2D slices. It has two distinct intersections. While the intersections with the XY plane look not so interesting, intersections with XZ or YZ planes look much better, and it can appear even more interesting if we rotate it. We can make intersections with a 4D hypertorus too. But how to rotate a four-dimensional object? In our three-dimensional space we have three parameters to describe a rotation. How many parameters do four-dimensional objects have? At first, I thought that a four-dimensional object needs four parameters to describe a rotation. In 3D space, we usually rotate objects around axes. We can rotate it around the x-axis or the y-axis or the z-axis. But it's not actually the case for other dimensions. It just so happens that in three-dimensional space, position and rotation are described with the same number of parameters. In a two-dimensional plane, an object can rotate only around the z-axis that doesn't even exist in two dimensions. So the correct way of describing rotations is to say that a rotation happens not around an axis but inside a plane. Zero-dimensional space is just a point and one-dimensional space is just a line. There are no planes in such spaces, so there are no rotations. 
There is one plane in the two-dimensional space, so it needs only one parameter to describe a rotation. In 3D we can construct three orthogonal planes, so we need three parameters to describe a rotation. And in 4D we already need six planes, so we can rotate a four-dimensional object with our three ordinary parameters. And also three extra parameters specific for the four-dimensional space. We have already seen 2D slices of a rotating 3D torus. But what about 3D slices of a rotating 4D hyper torus? Let's also look at a rotating 3-dimensional cube. And at a rotating 4-dimensional hypercube. But how do you construct a 4-dimensional object? And after you describe it mathematically, how do you draw it on a screen? For this video I mostly use a technique called ray marching. There are a lot of great videos on this topic. I'll put all the links in the description. Ray marching requires every shape to be solid. That's why I use walls instead of spheres, because a sphere is just a surface and not the actual solid with the volume included. And in this video by cylinder or torus, I mean a solid cylinder and a solid torus. A common thing to do with ray marching is to make a 3D shape out of a 2D shape. There are two main methods for this, extrusion and revolution. Those methods can work with other number of dimensions too. If you start with a zero-dimensional point, you can extrude it to a one-dimensional line segment. But you can't revolve the point, because remember, rotation happens in a 2D plane. So let's start with the line segment. It's the only option in one-dimensional anyway, if we don't consider infinite lines. So I can extrude the line segment to a square, or I can rotate the line segment to get a disk. I wanted to call it a circle, but Wikipedia says it should be called a disk, so... Then I can extrude the square into a 3D cube, or I can revolve it to get a cylinder. The revolution of a disk on the other hand gives us a ball, and the revolution of the disk gives us the same cylinder we got from revolving a square. Let's now look at four-dimensional shapes. The extrusion of a cube gives us a tesseract. The revolution of a cube gives us a cubinger, a special four-dimensional type of cylinder. If we look at a usual three-dimensional cylinder from one side, it looks like a square or a rectangle. But from another side, it looks like a circle. A cubinger looks like a cylinder or a cube from different sides. The extrusion of a cylinder gives us a cubinder again, but the revolution of a cylinder gives us a spherender, a four-dimensional mix of a cylinder and a sphere. The extrusion of a ball gives us a spherender again, and the revolution of a ball gives us a four-dimensional ball. So, in four-dimensional space there are two shapes similar to a cylinder. Actually, there are three of them. But the third one uses a different method of construction. All of those shapes, cylinders, cubes, cubinders and more are called rototopes. To understand those four-dimensional objects better, we can slice them into a series of chunks one dimension lower. For example, the slices of a 3D ball look like this. Small circles, bigger circles and then smaller circles again. The slices of a cylinder look like circles of constant radius. But if the cylinder is rotated by 90 degrees, they look like growing and shrinking rectangles. The slices of a spherender look like spheres of constant radius, but if the spherender is rotated by 90 degrees, they look like growing and shrinking cylinders. The slices of a cubinder look like cylinders of constant size, but if the cubinder is rotated by 90 degrees, they look like growing and shrinking boxes. We can also add some offsets to a revolution to get a torus instead of a ball, or some kind of tube instead of a cylinder. With this method we can get a four-dimensional hypertorus, but not just one type, not even three like hypercylinders. There are a total of four main types of four-dimensional tori or hypertori. In 3D space we can get a 3D torus by rotating a 2D circle with some offset. So in 4D we can try to rotate a 3D ball with a 
an offset. This gives us a sphere torus. And here we can see a series of slices of a sphere torus. Instead of a ball, we can revolve a 3D torus in order to get a torus sphere. And here is the series of slices of a torus sphere. It is hollow inside, by the way. And finally, we can revolve a 3D torus with an offset to get a die torus. And here we can see the series of slices of a die torus. Those three hypertori can be generalized as 4D balls with two offsets. With the first offset you get a torus sphere. With the second you get a sphere torus. And with both offsets you get a die torus. But we can't get all the shapes with extrusion and rotation alone. So let's find another operation. We can use a Cartesian product in order to get new higher dimensional shapes. The Cartesian product in this case takes two shapes, A and B. And if point X is in A and point Y is in B, then point XY is in the new shape. The dimensionality of the resulting shape is just the dimensionality of A plus the dimensionality of B. Basic building blocks in such a case are n-dimensional balls, like a 1D line segment, a 2D disc or a 3D ball. We'll go up to 3 for now, otherwise we can get 5 or 6 dimensional shapes, let's save them for another video. Let's look at the examples of the Cartesian product. A line times a line equals a square. A line times a line times a line equals a cube. A circle times a line equals a cylinder. A line times a line times a line times a line, I don't know if they are Cartesian powers. Anyway, line to the fourth equals a tesseract. A circle times a line times a line equals a cubinder. A 3D ball times a line equals a spherinder. And finally, a disc times a disc gives us a duo cylinder, a new shape which we couldn't get with extrusion and revolution. As I showed before, a slice of a cubinder could look like either a cube or a cylinder, depending on the orientation of the cubinder. A slice of the spherinder could look like either a cylinder or a sphere. And a slice of our new duo cylinder looks like a cylinder or a cylinder. Yeah, it's half cylinder and half cylinder. Here are all the cylinders. With identical orientation they look the same, but if I start to rotate them in 4D we can see the differences. Let's also compare its slices to other cylinders. A series of cubinder slices looks like this. And a series of spherinder slices looks like this. And the slices of a duo cylinder look like cylinders with different heights. And if the duo cylinder is rotated by 90 degrees, they look like the same slices but rotated. Let's now take a Cartesian product of two circles, not disks. The resulting shape is infinitely thin, so let's add it some thickness. The shape we get is called a tiger, yes, like the animal tiger. Torus-like shapes are called toratops, and because tora means tiger in Japanese, they decided to call a Cartesian product of two circles a tiger. And here are all the four-dimensional tori. By the way, I'm going to make a video about 5 and 6 dimensional objects too, so press the like button and subscribe to this channel to see more.